we're going to talk about a lot of stuff today, so it's important that you do hear me. Um, I'll just introduce myself again. My name is Eric Beidelman. I work on the, the Chrome team. Uh, I, I love HTML5. It's what I do. I come speak to developers all around the world and educate them on the new cool stuff in the web platform. If you want to follow me on Google Plus or Twitter, there's my information there. Um, also, I have a blog that I don't really write to that often, but uh, there's some good stuff there. And of course, all the cool HTML5 rock stuff is always available. So web components. What the heck are web components? How many people have heard of this whole web components thing? One person. Fantastic. You guys are going to learn so much stuff. Um, web components are all around us. We just don't know it yet. So think embedded widgets, right? The Google Plus button, the Facebook Like button. These are all um, encapsulated markup and styling and functionality. But what we do to actually embed these in our page is wrap them in an iframe. There's also reusable, reusable libraries and frameworks. So in this case, we have you know, a rich text editor. Maybe it's just a text area that's been annotated in some way. And then we get a WYSIWYG editor out of it in some way, shape, or form. This stuff can all be a web component. So this talk is going to actually bring you back to the future. I think this is very appropriate for the talk. Um, we're bringing back markup. We're bringing back DOM as sort of the first class citizen in web development. It's actually a tectonic shift from what we're doing today with MVC frameworks, right? With MVC frameworks today, you have a bunch of JavaScript imperative APIs. With web components, you're kind of getting away from that and going back to what the web was good at, what HTML was good at, which is H HTML. Um, and so there's a lot of new stuff that we're going to talk about, new constructs, really, for building uh, more rich, com more complex applications. And I'm, we're calling this sort of the declarative renaissance, right? It's sort of, uh, again, a shift back to what the web is good at, which is DOM and markup. So I have to bring you down uh, memory lane, because once upon a time, HTML5 went through sort of the same identity crisis, right? A lot of people posted uh, blogs about what APIs in HTML5 and the specifications, what's not. People even built sites like this one. This is, is geolocation uh, part of HTML5.com? And of course, the answer is no, because the spec itself is not part of the HTML5 spec. But you know what? Who cares as a web developer? It's a new API I can play with in the web platform. It doesn't matter what spec it's in. So web components is actually this, the same exact thing for me. There's a bunch of new stuff that you can play within the platform. And the key players in this whole ecosystem are templates. So you can do things like scaffold out markup and use that later. So we have this in MVC framework, frameworks today, but we're going to have it very soon in the web platform natively. Custom elements. Uh, today, is there, there's been a lot of sessions and, and code labs and whatnot on web components. Um, this is yet another talk on web components, but you're going to be able to define your own ex uh, markup and customize markup and extend HTML's native capabilities and its own vocabulary with your own. And the last thing that sort of uh, is part of this whole web components thing is Shadow DOM. How many people have heard of Shadow DOM? Shadow DOM's crazy, crazy cool. Um, and we're going to talk a, li a little bit about it today. But it's really the mortar and the glue behind web components as we think about them as sort of this umbrella of technologies. And Shadow DOM is going to give us encapsulation and boundaries on the web for the first time. The supporting cast includes styles that are encapsulated and scoped. So if you're embedding something, a widget on your page, you don't want your styles to leak out in the outside world. And you don't want styles in the outside world to affect how your widget looks, right? You want some kind of guarantee that things are going to be preserved. Knowledge into app states. So we have mutation observers. We have object.observe now. Um, which are really cool and just starting to land. And then other supporting things like CSS variables, um, which is brand new, it's the calc function. You can use this stuff inside of web components to create some really cool dynamic things. So again, web components, an umbrella term now for a bunch of these different things that are coming together very nicely. So <laughs> boom, I love this guy. So get ready. There's a lot of stuff in this talk. Yeah. Surprises me every time he does it. Um, but the first thing I want to talk about is, is templates. And so this is the scaffolding and blueprint of sort of architecting your app. Believe it or not, templates, not a new concept, right? We're using these today in JavaScript MVC frameworks. Um, or just using them you know, straight up, like this example here. So what a lot of people have done for templating on the web today is had some off-screen you know, markup someplace using display none or the hidden attribute. And so that's not actually going to show on the page, right? But that DOM is still there. It's still on my page. I can do stuff with it. This is really nice because we're working with DOM. The browser is good at DOM. It understands it. So we just have this embedded in our page someplace, and it's just hidden. 
and then we can stamp that out as we, as we use this template later on. One major problem with this is that the resources are still loaded. So in this case, like the image tag, right, if I didn't have that logo.png set, the dev tools in the browser would actually complain that there's this 404 and this missing image. So just because this stuff is hidden, the browser is actually downloading the resources. So you're going to waste user bandwidth. Another thing is theming is, is, is very painful. So if I'm ever using this, this template, right, cloning it and using it in different places in my page, I actually have to style all of the, the, uh, the markup that I'm creating under this ID my template to get those styles that are encapsulated in this little region so they don't flow out. And so there's no guarantee if I'm embedding this on another person's page that they don't already have this my template ID style defined someplace. So that kind of sucks. Uh, method two is, is to do something with string manipulation. So this is a handlebars example, right? So handlebars just overrides the script tag. And setting, instead of setting a uh, JavaScript, text JavaScript, it's just another thing. And, and, the and the browser won't actually parse this as JavaScript. It'll just treat this as a string. So this is cool. This works. Um, but the real problem with this is that it encourages you know, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities because you're doing things with string injection. You're injecting uh, strings in the page, user supplied data, and then that's getting inner HTML inside of your, of your page. So luckily, what we have for the future as part of this Web Components ecosystem is the, a template tag, a proper template tag that does exactly what we want it to do. So this example here, I have an, a template tag. I have an ID set to it. You can see I have a missing image. That's totally cool, because this template is not going to render on the page. It's, not gonna, it's gonna essentially be inert. It's not gonna do anything until I actually stamp it out and use it someplace else. So we're working with DOM again. That's great. Love DOM. Also, the things, uh, it's parsed, but the things aren't rendered inside of it, as I said before. So if you have media in there, if you have images and video, those aren't gonna be pulled down by the browser until you actually you know, use this and make this template go live. And to make it go live, we'll just you know, use DOM manipulation. So we'll query selector for the template tag. Um, we'll set the image maybe dynamically at runtime. And then we'll just append the template's content. We'll clone it, and we'll append that to the page. And so that makes the thing active. That makes it go live. All your resources are going to come in, and the thing can be used on the page. And we can do that because the template element is going to inherit from the HTML element, and it's just a, a document fragment. So we can clone that. We can enter HTML that, and then append that to the page. So that's templating of the future baked in the web platform. I think that's pretty cool. Paul Irish and Paul Lewis, two of my colleagues, think that's pretty, pretty money as well. They're a big fan of the template tag. I want to talk a little bit about Shadow DOM. Shadow DOM's a big one. We're not going to cover everything under the sun. But it's really the sort of building block of this encapsulation and these boundaries that we're setting up now with web components. Oh, he's frozen. That's terrible. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so encapsulation, right, not a new concept, but it's a new concept for the web. Encapsulation is sort of this fundamental thing of object-oriented programming, right? You set up guarantees, you set up interfaces and for, those, for those APIs, and you have some guarantee of how something's going to be used. So you, you separate the code you write as the developer, right, the class uh, or the constructor or whatever, and then the person that consumes it knows how to use that. And there's encapsulation between these different realms. But again, we don't have this on the web. This kind of sucks, right? Why don't we have these fundamental things of software development for web development? Well, we do have something. We have the iframe, right? How many people like, love to work with iframes? Iframes are told <laughs> one person. Um, yeah, I don't like them either. Iframes are terrible. They're, they're really heavy. Uh, there's a lot of problems. You have to you know, post message data to and from them. You have to get the content window. Um, there's, there's different um, security issues with iframes. And so they're just they're super heavy for our purposes, and we should have something better. And so that's where Shadow DOM comes in. So it turns out, today, in the browser, in WebKit, DOM nodes can already host hidden DOM. What does that mean? So here's a video tag, right? And unfortunately, my movie is, is not loading. But you can see this video tag if I go in the dev tools and inspect this guy. that it's, it's really nice, right? For the first time in, in HTML5, we get a video tag, we set a source, boom, we got a movie on our page, no plugins whatsoever. But if you check it out, right, and you look at this a little cl more closely, there's UI around this video tag. It's not just the video. There's a button. There's a play button. There's a volume control. There's a slider. There's a full screen widget. 
So clearly, uh oh, we're going retro. Um, clearly, there's something more going on than meets the eye. Okay, I'll try to stay off that. Um, a new feature in the DevTools is to be to, to go into experimental features and turn on what's called Show Shadow DOM. So I'll do that, and I'll restart the DevTools. Get back to that video tag. And you can see what I get now is a little arrow next to the video tag. So indeed, something is going on here. I can drill down in that, and what I see now is the Shadow DOM, the Shadow Root, this hidden DOM that's sort of attached itself to my video tag. I can drill down in that and see the video tag is just made up of divs within divs. And then when I get down to the meat of it, right, it's an input button. Hopefully you can see this. Sorry about this. It's an input. It's a bunch of input elements uh, and range sliders and buttons. So that is the shadow DOM. It's this hidden markup that I can't actually navigate or traverse into from JavaScript, but it exists. It's there. It's being rendered uh, not in C++, right, not in native code, but the browser is rendering this in markup. That's pretty cool. How does that exist? And there's a lot of examples of this um, throughout the, the different pieces of the, the new input elements, for example. So the date picker, for instance, is composed of a shadow DOM with a bunch of divs. And you can see in here, each of these little things as I mouse over them is just a div. And so it provides its own API. There's a JavaScript API there and, and markup associated with this input. But to the user, all I see is an input tag. That's what I'm using on my page. So <laughs> browser vendors have really been holding out on this because there's a cool feature that we can't use today. Well, now we can use it, but we haven't been able to before. So Shadow DOM, here's my definition of Shadow DOM. It, it really exposes the same internals browser vendors have been using to implement their, their own controls, um, and it exposes that to web developers. So we get that functionality. We get that, that uh, sort of encapsulation boundary. And this is really, really powerful stuff. Conceptually, this is what Shadow DOM looks like. So you saw the input tag, right? That was my input. And maybe it has a bunch of children in it. Um, and then I attach this sort of hidden tree, this shadow root, they call it, to that, that host element. So it's hosting my shadow root. And the box here is actually very important. So that's the encapsulation boundary. Nothing is going to cross over into that world. It's sort of hosting this hidden, this hidden content. And so maybe my markup, my original markup, has a bunch of green children, right? It's got its own markup. And my shadow DOM, my pink stuff, has its own markup. But when I merge those two together, when I attach the Shadow DOM to that host node, what's actually going to render instead, and you saw that in the example, is, is the Shadow root. So everything in the Shadow tree is replacing that markup in the host element. And if you remember that from the input, the Shadow root is replacing all of that, anything inside of that tag. So creating Shadow DOM is actually really easy. This is an experimental feature now uh, within Chrome Canary. You can enable it in about.flags. And uh, this is a, a very simple example, but let's say I have a host node, right, with an ID host. It's got some markup in it. It's got my title. Uh, it's got my subtitle and a div in there, right? And then I'll just query selector for that host node, and I'll create a shadow root for that node. So I'm attaching a shadow tree to this host element, and I'll just enter HTML a bunch of markup inside of that shadow tree. And what I get back is, yo, you got replaced. So you don't see my title. You don't see my subtitle or the, the div in there in the original host. It's completely been replaced by the shadow root itself. So just to prove to you here, we'll go in the dev tools again. We have that host node. And boom, there's my original markup. But that's not actually what's being rendered at render time. It's the shadow root that's, that's doing the magic now. So it's completely taken over. <laughs> So markup's cool, hidden DOM is cool, but if you can't do anything with styling, like what's the point, right? We have all these cool uh, special effects now in CSS. And being able to encapsulate your styles is very important if you're going to embed a widget onto your page. So styles by default, the style tag in Shadow DOM is, is scoped. Anything that's in that, uh, that CSS rule with inside of your shadow tree won't sort of bleed over into the outside world. So in this example, I'm doing the exact same thing, right? I have my, my host node. I'm setting some shadow DOM content to it. And I have a style tag that's going to style all H2s red. And certainly enough, that's what it does. It styles my H2, yo, you've got replaced red. But you'll notice, right, this is my, the, the uh, dash line signifies my, my element. It, those H2, that rule, that global rule to style all H2s is not affecting this H2 in the slide deck itself. 
So that inner style that I've set has been, it doesn't cross the shadow boundary. It's been encapsulated. But we also have complete control over what sort of bleeds in from the outside world. Maybe you have a you know, calendar widget or a comment widget that you embed on, someone, on, on your page. And you want to inherit you know, sort of the look and feel of the page that is embedding you. And so you can do that with the apply author styles and the reset style inheritance properties. So same example as before, but this time when I uh, apply author styles and set that to true, you can see that my H2 has now been sort of taken the look and feel of the style sheet. So the outside world is now bleeding in to my inner shadow DOM. And so all those styles that are affecting this content are being applied. Similarly, I can choose at the shadow boundary, right, at this box when the shadow tree is being, is being rendered. I can choose to reset all styles and just say, let me, let me sort of start with a fresh slate, set all my properties to initial. And so you can see in this case, um, I have my H2 set back to what they were before. The font face has changed. The size is different. Uh, styles are now back to their initial state. So that's styles encapsulated inside of your shadow tree in your widget. Also, bleeding into your, your style uh, widget. What about actually styling the element that hosts your content? Um, you can do that with a new at host rule. Um, and at host, anything inside of that will match that host element that you're attaching to. So in this case, I've set up a host rule to transition you know, my opacity when I hover over the shadow tree. And I'm just using uh, less syntax here as well, or, or SAS syntax, just to show that these, uh, some of these properties are still vendor prefixed. So that's being able to style the element itself, right? Maybe change the state. Maybe you have a button or some kind of cool button that when I activate it, it does something different. But more specifically, we have things like this, right? We have an input element, a slider. It's got a bunch of shadow DOM attached to it. I just went off the page there, but that's OK. Inside of this, we have right, the thumb track. And people a long time ago have figured out how to style these. So they've actually looked up uh, the properties in, say, the WebKit or Firefox source. And if I drill down into some of these, there's a bunch of these for different types of elements, right? Let me bump that up for you guys. So each of these, this is what WebKit is, is uh, styling these elements by default. And so people have figured out that you can then tap into this in your own style sheets and style like an input uh, in any way you want. So you can get some crazy cool things. For instance, if I wanted to style this input background in a blue slider, I can totally do that because I have access to this pseudo uh, custom element, this pseudo element here. And you can get super crazy with this, right? I mean, you can round the corners, you can stick in a gradient, um, make you know this, this slider, this native sort of implement this native input in the browser, look uh, and feel any way you want. And so that is what a custom pseudo element, uh, where that comes in. We can do this also in our widget. We can define uh, with an x dash and then a name property. We can define a pseudo attribute to say, I want to style, I want to let users style this very particular element in any way they want. And so in the host node, I can get a handle on that, and I can style the background of my slider any way I want. So you can define your own sort of styling hooks into certain sections of your shadow tree. Another way you can sort of inject styles from the outside world is to use CSS variables. So CSS variables are pretty cool. They're coming to us in the web platform. Um, you can enable them right now in WebKit. So there's a flag for uh, experimental WebKit features. And so you can, as an author, as a widget author, you can include variable placeholders in maybe your shadow tree. So this is the shadow DOM style. And I'm including a placeholder for the text of the button and also the font face that I want the button to be styled with, or let the users choose their own font face. And of course, when I'm embedding this widget on my page, I'm a big fan of Comic Sans, so I'm going to style that guy up with Comic Sans, right? I'm going to call it, and I'm going to color it green. And so we're passing these CSS variables now into uh, our shadow DOM. So more styling hooks, this is great for something like theming, where you want to take on the look and feel of a page and let users be able to style certain sections. So if you remember our host node, um, right, this is what we had in our markup. We had my title. We had my subtitle. Um, and what it actually rendered as in the browser was this shadow root. So that's just a, sort of a, a hidden element that you see. And we replaced it with the style tag and the H2 that says, yo, you got replaced. Sorry about that and my awesome content. So 
you might ask yourself, like, what's the point of this markup then if we're just replacing it every time with this hidden markup? So this is where uh, insertion points come into play. Insertion points are pretty cool. So left side is my original tree. It's my, my host node with the, the title, the H1, the H2, and the div, right, with a bunch of children. We'll attach a shadow tree to it. But in the shadow tree, we can actually stamp out sort of holes of where the original content can flow into. And that's what these uh, orange, very hard to see insertion points come into play. And so what happens at render time is that the shadow host is rendering the shadow DOM, but we're rendering it and flowing sort of content from the original node into the shadow tree. Now, if that doesn't make sense, hopefully this does. This is a little bit of code. Um, so insertion points are essentially the content element. There's a new content element. And you use CSS selectors to sort of pick out parts of the host node and make them flow into your shadow tree. So again, this is my, uh, on the left side, I have my original host with a bunch of markup. Uh, I still have my H2 applied. And I have a content selecting the, the first H2 it finds, right? So all H, sorry, all H2s will flow into this content. So you can see what's actually rendered is my H2, my subtitle is there now, which is cool. In between, I have you got enhanced instead of you got replaced. So I'm adding markup, extra markup to this thing in my shadow tree. And then this last, uh, the second style rule here selects the first H1, just pulls that guy out. So my, you know, I'm re sort of reordering things as it, from what it appeared in my original host. I'm reordering them in my shadow tree using the content insertion points. And this last rule just gets everything else. So in this case, it's, it's just the div, sorry about that selecting, uh, using the star, just a CSS selector star saying everything else just flow in sort of at the bottom here. And at render time, I get, I get this instead of this um, and instead of the, uh, the previous example. So being able to stamp out sort of places where things can flow into, uh, what it really boils down to is sort of a declarative API, right? Insertion points give us the ability to define sort of where things flow into. Um, as a user, right, my left side, this is, this is the markup I have on my page. Maybe I'm in, in embedding this widget on my page. And the author can change whatever they want inside of the shadow tree. But my markup still stays the same, the exact same on the host node. So they can change the look and feel and how things want they want. But I don't have to do anything, which is really great. There's a guarantee that my stuff's not going to break just because theirs does. So encapsulation, boundaries, reusability on the web platform. Paul Irish also really likes that one. He's giving you the cha-ching. Animated GIFs never get old, right? They're so good. <laughs> Fortunately, they eat up a ton of memory in the browser. That's cool. Next part of the web uh, components sort of ecosystem is model-driven views. Uh, one thing that I really want to highlight is, is, and it actually just landed last week was in Canary under a flag, was object.observe. So this is the ability to actually watch for and, and, and subscribe to changes on a JavaScript object. So for instance, this example here, I'll just go out and paste in the dev tools. Whoops. So I have this object O, right? And I want to observe changes on it. I want to know what properties are added, what properties are deleted, what if they change, for instance. So I'll create an observer for that object, and I'll set you know, just a name property, for instance, to Eric. And what happens is I get a callback for that. When that changes in my JavaScript, uh, I get a callback. I know what's changed. The name property's changed. How did it change? It was added. It was new. Its old value was undefined because it didn't exist before on the object. And its present value is Eric. And so if I change that to my last name, Boom, I'll get a callback for that as well. So the name changed. It, it was updated instead of it was new this time. Its old value is Eric, and its new value is Beitelman. So this is really, really cool stuff. If I batch two of these changes together, uh, maybe I'll just add and just to sh specify something different here. So I'm going to change two different properties of this JavaScript object. And what happens is I only get one callback, right? Um, I think my demo's messed up. But the important thing is that you only get called once. So you can have maybe a 1,000 changes to this JavaScript object, but you only get one callback. So it's actually really good for performance. You get a list of changes as they've changed over time. So why do I mention this? This is actually uh, very important for model uh, MVC frameworks. A lot of MVC frameworks like Angular, um, how many people have used Angular, by the way? Yeah, good, bad. 
Angular, Angular is, is one of my favorites for various reasons, but um, one thing they, they do a lot is experiment with some of this newer stuff as it comes out in the web platform. And so the way uh, Angular does data binding is that they do dirty checking. So essentially, Angular, you know, you specify all these binding properties, and it, uh, every once in a while when the user interacts with the page, it'll go through all these JavaScript objects and then say, did you change? So it does this sort of polling system. And so they actually experimented with a, a, a prototype build of Chromium without any optimizations or anything in the object.observe in V8. And they saw, uh, what was it, like a 20 to 40x improvement on performance. So you can imagine what happens if, if all the JavaScript frameworks of the world adopt something like this for their, their model-driven views. We're going to get faster just by default, right? That's really cool. And where this stuff is actually heading is native data binding, native model-driven views inside of the browser. So in this example, I'm, uh, I'm reusing the, the template tag. Right? And so this is inert markup. It's not going to do anything until I actually act upon it. Um, and then I'm creating a model. So this is not finalized syntax yet, but this is what things, sort of how things are, are being spec'd out. So I can set up a model on this example node. It's gonna, that model, that data model, is going to be scoped to that element. And then my model is just an array of objects with name and a skill set array. And then I can use the template and the iterator to sort of iterate through that, that JavaScript object. And so this is sort of model-driven views at its best. You can combine this with a web component, right? And then you can have a really cool dynamic uh, application. I want to point out that um, Angular, you know, again, it's one of my favorites. I'm, I'm picking on it. But it's actually very close. If you look at this example, this is the same exact example in Angular as this previous example of where things are sort of uh, uh, hoping to go. So the template, right, we have an li that we're rendering the name and then a, a, a sub sort of child ul in there. And the Angular example is, is, is stunningly close, actually. So we have a controller that sets up a model on, and scopes it to that cer certain section of DOM. Same uh, object. And then we'll use, instead of you know, template iterate, we'll use ng repeat, which is Angular's sort of way of iterating through an object. And we'll do the exact same thing. This is a, a live example here at the bottom. So where Angular is sort of is today, you know, they're sort of spearheading a lot of this stuff as it's being thought out and, and bringing, um, bringing this stuff to the web platform natively. Also, money. Big fan of data binding and model-driven views. So custom elements. This leads, all this, all this mumbo jumbo that I've been speaking about for the past uh, 30 minutes leads to custom elements. And I'm going to try to fly through this. This is what a custom element looks like today on the web, right? This is an example of a YUI tab control. We have some markup. Um, it's using ULs and LIs for the tab strips and the content. And then what you do typically in these frameworks is that you, you know, have a constructor, you have some kind of view, um, and then you have a bunch of imperative JavaScript that you, you set up, right? So you attach this view to a source node to think of this as the shadow, the equivalent to the shadow root, right? And then you call render. And what you get is this cool little widget here. There's actually nothing basic about this. If you look under the hood of what happens right, in your DOM, um, you have a ton of crazy classes, a bunch of extra markup, um, you have some ARIA roles, tab indexes. How do I like, deal with this as a developer unless I know and if I'm familiar with that JavaScript API that's specified for the widget library? So this is pretty insane, right? Um, so what we have coming in, in web components um, is creating custom elements, extending HTML's existing knowledge base with your own uh, custom elements. So we have the element tag, and we can define a name for it, x tabs, we'll call it. And we'll use template. So this thing is going to be inert until we actually use it someplace. We can define the uh, styles. We can use insertion points with the content tag. To actually use this, we'll just include it, right? We'll maybe put this markup in the top in a, in a file called x-tabs.html, and we'll include it with a rel components inside of our page that we want to embed it into. And then we can just use that, exactly what we mean. So it's an x-tabs tag, and it's got a bunch of functionality in it. Say what you mean. So using insertion points, we, we can define declarative API. So maybe certain sections of this X tabs flow into you know, the tab elements, and certain flow into the content area. Or we can also define an imperative API, JavaScript API. So if I want to do that, I can have a constructor on the element. And that constructor is put in the global namespace, so then I can call it later on from the JavaScript page that embeds it. I 
can set up you know, functions and, uh, and, and essentially create an API for this widget. So when do something is clicked, when this component is clicked, we'll call the do something method. So declarative APIs and also imperative APIs. You can create new elements. You can also extend existing functionality in HTML. So if I wanted to sort of extend the existing button, right, HTML button tag, I could do that with a custom element. I'll call it x dash mega button because mega is so it's going to be it's huge. It's going to be huge on the web. It extends button, and then sorry about this, but the constructor is just mega button constructor. And so when this guy is clicked, and I embed this in a, in a page, it's going to look exactly like a regular button, right? I'm extending button, but I can style this any way I want in my shadow tree. So this is the markup on the page here, x mega button, and you can see. The content element here is an insertion point, so it's taking that text and inserting it into my, my shadow tree. But this button's special, right? This button, when I hover over it, it does something crazy. It's extending the functionality of the native button. And when I click on this, no. it's a no. mega button. No. Mega button is no ordinary button. It's extending the functionality of HTML. And the way I've done that is with an imperative API, right? When I click, I fire off the web audio API and play a sound um, and style it with the shadow tree and the host element and, and all that jazz. So an example, again, picking an Angular, um, they're doing a lot of things right. And, and where this stuff is going is very similar to where it is today with, with something like AngularJS, which is a great, great uh, framework. On the left side is my web component. This is what my markup looks like. Um, this is what someone, when they embed my X tabs element on their page, would do. They would have a H2 specified in the content section. And then I use insertion points to funnel that in and make it look like I want, make it into an actual tab widget in my shadow, el my shadow element. In Angular, uh, it's strikingly similar again. So they have the ability to define custom tags in, in Angular with a bunch of crazy you know, uh, voodoo magic that happens under the hood in Angular. But it's very similar. So you have a tabs, right? Um, and you have a panel up or a pane that you can create. And what you get, uh, here's a live demo of this, is something that looks extremely similar. Uh, on my left side here, I have the web component version, which is a tab widget. So here's the markup for that. On the right side, I have Angular and what Angular is doing under the hood. So I've defined a bunch of imperative APIs in Angular. And then the thing looks exactly the same. Um, as a comparison, I tried to do this in Ember, and uh, the code for Ember is actually is quite different, right? It's uh, it's not as pretty. Um, and, and, um, Ember is a great framework, but it's it's not quite um, it's not quite where things are going, I think. And so that's the important message I want to drive home today. If you're curious to know what this thing looks like, um, we'll pop open that web component. So this is my web component tab controller. Um, and I have, I have insertion points, right? So I'm funneling H2s into a certain region inside of a div that I'm styling to make it look like tab elements. I've defined an imperative API. So when the thing is clicked, uh, when a tab is clicked, maybe change its class to style it in a certain way to signify it's active or something like that. And what I didn't talk about, because uh, we don't have time, is is a life cycle events. And this is where mutation observers uh, come into play. So being able to know when your element changes state in the DOM, if it's inserted, if it's removed, if an attribute on it changes, you can sort of get hooks into that and then update your widget according to how the user's interacting with it. And just to show you what the Angular version looks like. So of course, Angular has its own API to define custom elements. And it's a bunch of extra stuff, right? It's crazy stuff. I can make it look exactly like the web component. Um, but you know, they have their own special directives. And the way you define elements is all through JavaScript and not sort of declared. So defining, extending, creating new elements in HTML are part of web components baked in the web platform. Boom, he's back. <laughs> So don't forget to you know, try this stuff out. Google uh, Chrome Canary has a lot of these features I showed. All these live demos are available today because we have flags that you can enable, right? experimental WebKit features for object.observe and some of the CSS properties. Um, enabled uh, Shadow DOM in the dev tool, so you can actually debug this stuff if you're trying out Shadow DOM. Um, I use the Web Components Polyfill, which is a, a great polyfill on GitHub that Dimitri, the, one of the spec authors, put together. 
Um, and so you can use that to sort of try and test some of this stuff out um, as, a, as a polyfill solution. Mozilla has an X tags polyfill solution. Um, so that's for creating custom elements. And there's a ton of resources. I will post these slides uh, to my Twitter handle. So it's eBytal. You can follow me on Google Plus as well. And all this stuff will be available there. So I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming to the session, guys. Hopefully you learned a lot about web components. How actually this fancy thing you showed uh, has you know, played with the web standards? Will it be standardized in the future or anything like that? Because Absolutely. Sorry, I keep stepping on that cord. Uh, go ahead and finish. If yeah, oh. that was a question. Mostly there's, a ton of, there's a ton of uh, spec work going on. It's taken two years to get Shadow DOM to the place it is today, and that's because of all the spec work that's been going on. So for instance, Shadow DOM uh, spec that Dimitri's been working on, a few other folks have been working on, is being thought about through uh, various browser vendors, um, through the, the web applications working group. And we have uh, standards going on for all this stuff. And it's taking a long time, but you're starting to see the fruits of that labor come when we have native support for Shadow DOM, under a flag, of course, that it's experimental, and, uh, and some of these other properties as well. It looks awesome. Uh, I have a question. Is it polyfillable? Only Google for what? Uh, can we, is there a way to, I can write this now and somehow it will polyfill well into uh, browsers that don't support uh, Shadow DOM and things like that? Yeah, so the, the polyfill, um, where is it? The polyfill for, for web components is here. It was basically just a, a reason for him to, Dimitri, to experiment with Shadow DOM and try out some of these ideas as he was specking them out. Um, that's sort of been by the wayside as he's, as he's implemented other stuff. Other folks have come along. Uh, Mozilla is really interested in this stuff, and they've implemented a pretty, pretty awesome polyfill that uh, you can use to do custom. Let's see if I can find an example here. Um, custom elements, and so this works actually in a lot of browsers, and I think it's even something crazy like IE8, for instance. Um, oh yeah, here we go. So that's really good browser support. Uh, again, a lot of this stuff is still kind of changing, but this is a is a good an experimentation library if you want to say create a super input, for example. Um, and so they're maintaining this right now. The really important piece that is, is, is only available in Chrome right now is Shadow DOM. Um, so that's something you really can't polyfill because it's so crazy cool and, and you know, wicked. Um, and and they, all the encapsulation and stuff, it's really hard to replicate that in JavaScript um, and hide and abstract that away. So that, that is currently what's in, uh, on the playing field. But yeah, there's, there's a couple polyfills that you can start to play with. Good question. Another question. We still have f some time if you have questions. Unless there is somebody else waiting. OK, I want to ask you, uh, because this templating looks very interesting, is it possible to embed also some script in, oh sorry. <laughs> sorry, is it still possible to embed a script that will be executed whenever the template is being used, wherever in the, in the website? For example, uh, let's say tabs on a web page. If we create a template for the tabs, then obviously there needs to be some kind of initialization for the tab element. It would be cool if you could wrap the entire template with the accompanying script so it can be reused everywhere else without explicitly initializing ourselves. So is it possible to put some script that will be always executed whenever we use a template? Yeah, you could probably use mu mutation observers for that. Um, I don't know if this directly answers your question, but where was it? So at least in the web components world, there is this notion of life cycle events. And I kind of, I really just glossed over it. But this is sort of um, when this template is activated, right? When this custom element is activated, you get insight into when it's created, um, when it's inserted into the DOM. So at creation time is different than insertion time, right? And then whether it's removed. And also there's an attribute change. So that's actually, you can do the same thing if you wanted to using mutation observers on the template itself. But so what I mean is it will happen automatically when the object is inserted. We don't have to write the observer uh, method ourselves. Well, then how? So you're talking about like a global event bubbling or something at the top of the document that uh, always yeah, gets exactly. activated? You, you could do that. You could do that with uh, mutation observers on the document itself and then mm -hmm. get notified of when a, you know, a template element, for instance, is instantiated or used. OK, I get the idea. Yeah. OK, thanks. <laughs>